Born in London in 86, a stash show gent named Richard Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and belts round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. There's two things he loves, it's getting at, and belts round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, handhelds round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. Over the years, I have noticed that on the Information Superhighway and in the land of YouTube, people constantly heap praise on Japan for all of their contributions to the world of gaming. Which, to be fair, is expected. After all, the land of the rising sun is the home of Sega, Sony, and those lovable scamps we all like to talk about, Nintendo. They have even produced some large third party publishers over the years, such as Konami, Namco and Capcom for example. What you may or may not know though, is that Great Britain has churned out an insane amount of amazing titles over the years too. So for that reason, this is the first video of many where I shall be spotlighting how the world of video gaming would be a completely different place without the extremely heavy British influence. I really do feel that many people around the world need a bloody good education, education, education on this subject. According to my analytics, 60% of the people who view my channel hail from just two countries, the United Kingdom and the United States. Two countries with very similar gaming cultures today, but vastly different gaming scenes in the 1980s. We all know the 1980s US story by now. At the beginning of the decade, Atari ruled supreme. This company managed to somewhat monopolise the continent to some degree, however by the time 1983 came around, the people on the whole got sick of their dated crap and stopped buying video games altogether. This was until Japanese company Nintendo entered the fray, with higher quality games rejuvenating the US market with a little bit of monopolisation of their own. In my home country of jolly old England in the 1980s, it was a completely different story. We never had a silly video game crash on these shores, because consumers have never let one company control an industry. Atari were around and consistently did quite well. Funnily enough, it was even the most popular selling console in the UK as late as Christmas bloody 1989. But to be fair, that was only because us Brits prefer to game on more sophisticated microcomputers, rather than the less diverse consoles that were available at the time. American platforms were more popular than the NES, such as the Commodore 64 and the Amiga, and so was Sir Alan Sugar's Amstrad sales-wise, it outperformed it too. And a system that defeated all of these platforms was the mighty ZX Spectrum, which I will talk more about shortly. Anyway, on the subject of the NES, the NES did exist here, but for various reasons which I have talked about in previous videos, not a lot of people were interested in the product, and the system sold terribly here. The NES may have been number one in the United States and Japan, however in the UK in 1989, Nintendo consoles would have been the seventh most popular gaming platform, lagging behind the Master System, the Amstrad CPC-464, the Amiga, the Commodore 64, the ZX Spectrum, and even the bloody Atari VCS. What a failure. I have done multiple videos in the past about how the ZX Spectrum managed to defeat all of these huge behemoths in my domestic market, and even stand by my point that consumer-wise it was probably the best choice for most people. In my comment section in the past, I have had angry Nintendo fanboys absolutely outraged at me for daring to make such a statement. Despite the fact that the ZX Spectrum offered 24,000 games, easy piracy, low cost gaming and functioned in more ways than just a little device that could play your games. The main point these fanatics have thrown at me in the past is that apparently the ZX Spectrum has done absolutely nothing for gaming, whereas the NES apparently saved the industry. I have always found this particularly amusing, considering that the NES couldn't even penetrate a market where healthy competition already existed. So, Nintendo may have never saved the video game industry outside of the domestic US market, however it could be argued that the British ZX Spectrum has in fact saved Nintendo from Doom before. So, let us take a look at how this story came into fruition. Let us start by going back to 1982. 
when Sir Clive Sinclair released the ZX Spectrum. The Spectrum was the third microcomputer released in a series, following the ZX80 released in 1980 and the ZX81 released in 1981. This line of computers was specifically designed to make home computing affordable and accessible for literally everyone who lived in the UK, which was obviously groundbreaking stuff at the time. The original ZX80 was the first ever computer to retail at under £100 on release, however the device was very basic and in black and white. The ZX Spectrum on the other hand offered a colour display and was among the first computers to reach a mainstream audience in the UK. The introduction of the ZX Spectrum led to a boom in companies producing software and hardware for the machine, the effects of which are still seen today. Some people even credit it as the machine which launched the UK IT industry as a whole. Clive Sinclair was given a knighthood for his services to British industry. Over the years, the ZX Spectrum became more and more popular. However, the main reason for its popularity was for its functionality as a gaming platform. There was one key difference though between most people who gamed on an NES in the States and the Brits who gamed in the UK success equivalent of the Spectrum. NES gamers would simply play games on their devices, whereas a large majority of Spectrum owners would also have a try at developing games themselves. Throughout this era of gaming, it was common practice for gamers in my country to actually learn how to code using BASIC. To compare US and UK gaming once again, Americans would buy a Nintendo Power magazine, which had a focus on walkthroughs and cheats, whereas Brits on the other hand would buy magazines such as Sinclair User and Your Sinclair magazine. These magazines would regularly print code that Specky users could copy and work with on their own machines and this created a network of bedroom developers and classic games that sometimes could be purchased for just a couple of pounds and could be played for hours and hours at a time. Perhaps now this will give you a better picture on why 24,000 games exist on the spectrum. The machine just had such a passionate hard working user base. It wasn't just in bedrooms people were learning to code in, in the early 80s in the UK. Oh no no no. It was absolutely huge in schools at the time too. Schools at the time had BBC microcomputer systems, a series of microcomputers and associated peripherals designed and built by Acorn Computer Company for the BBC's computer literacy project. These systems were designed with an emphasis on education. It was notable for its ruggedness, expandability and the quality of its operating system. The BBC also had moderate success as home computers in the UK too, despite its high costs. So throughout the early 80s in the UK, there was probably more people coding at home and coding in schools than there was anywhere else in the world. For a short period, the United Kingdom were pioneers in the IT field and most likely had the most computer literate people on the whole planet. This was the period in time where so many British developers first got their foot on the ladder and had their first go at coding and this thriving microcomputer scene is the very reason we saw such a ridiculous abundance of top level British games around the world throughout the 90s and noughties. To focus in slightly more now on the title of this video, how did all of this save Nintendo you may ask? It all started with the ZX Spectrum and a development house known as Ultimate Play the Game. Developers Tim and Chris Stamper made some fun titles for the platform such as Jetpack, Attic Attack, Sable Wolf and Night Law. Early on Chris and Tim had good foresight and believed continuing to work on the Specky would not be beneficial to their company's growth. So the pair began to inspect a little imported console from Japan, known as the Famicom. They came to the belief that the Famicom would be an ideal future platform of choice for the company, as the Famicom had more of a worldwide appeal than the Spectrum. As you may be aware though, Nintendo are very conservative and protectionist in their business dealings. So in order to get a foot in the door, the pair would need to come up with a good game plan. The Giro's aim became to reverse engineer the Famicom and investigate the codes for Famicom games to learn more about the console's programming. Chris and Tim were successful in their endeavours and as a result the company decided to sell the ultimate brand to US Gold and cease games development for the ZX Spectrum in the following year. Chris and Tim prepared several tech demos and showed them to the Nintendo executives. Nintendo were in shock since they had once claimed that it would be impossible for their console to be decoded. 
Impressed with their efforts, Nintendo decided to grant the team an unlimited budget for them to work on games for their Famicom platform. This was the birth of the British gaming studio, popularly known as Rare. Throughout the NES era of gaming, most of the titles from Rare were average I suppose at the very best. The studio used their ridiculous unlimited budget to create a very large variety of different games. Their original business model seemed to be quantity over quality I suppose, much like most Let's Play channels out there today. The greedy buggers worked on over 60 titles, which is a lot of bloody games for one company to pump out over such a short period. Whilst most of these games are absolute tripe, I do not mind Battletoads vs Double Dragon I suppose. So overall Rare certainly were not a highlight on the NES and probably contributed better gaming wise to the ZX Spectrum. Rare noticed that despite the huge catalogue of games, none became critical successes for the company. So when the Super Nintendo era rolled around, Rare decided to invest their profits into purchasing expensive silicon graphics workstations to make three dimensional models. Rare successfully managed to use this technology to produce 3D models and graphics before pre-rendering these graphics onto Super Nintendo cartridges. This process impressed Nintendo so much that in 1994 Nintendo bought a 25% stake in the British company, which gradually increased to 49%, making Rare a second party developer for Nintendo. Due to this second party deal, Rare were offered to develop a game using pretty much any Nintendo intellectual property they liked, and they decided to opt for Donkey Kong. Obviously the resulting game from this was Donkey Kong Bloody Country, which was developed by a total of 20 people and enjoyed an 18 month long development cycle. Donkey Kong sold over 8 million copies worldwide, making it the second best selling game in the entire Super Nintendo library. So can a Nintendo fanboy ask me a game please, how the ZX Spectrum has never contributed anything to gaming? This game of the year obviously saw multiple sequels including the likes of Donkey Kong Country 2 and 3 on the platform. Rare released several handheld spin-offs too, known as the Donkey Kong Land series. Outside of DK Country, Rare also released Killer Instinct on the platform, which was a breath of fresh air at the time within the fighting genre. By this point, Rare had a team of over 250 people working for them. Whilst Rare were a massive contributing factor to the success of the Super Nintendo, the Nintendo 64 was a different kettle of fish altogether. Throughout the platform's lifespan, the Nintendo 64 lagged way behind the Sony PlayStation. As discussed in so much content online, Nintendo made a lot of silly mistakes throughout this time period. The biggest of which, in my opinion, was to opt to continue to use cartridges as a storage medium, as opposed to CDs. This meant that most third party developers with any sense opted to make games for the Sony PlayStation instead. This was done due to the fact that CDs were cheaper to buy and mass produce, and more importantly offered far more storage than that of the primitive cartridges. Like the thought of fitting Final Fantasy VII for example on a Nintendo 64 cartridge is laughable. Cartridges were primitive and way past their sell by date by the late 90s. Nintendo lost most of their third party support, ultimately leading to a laughably small library of games being released on the platform. Nintendo's place on top of the gaming world was finally over and ended up finishing in third place in their homeland of Japan behind both the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. Although commercially not as successful as its competition or predecessors, the Nintendo 64 still had its fair share of decent titles. However, interestingly, I would say at least a third of those games were from Rare. Rare managed to release 11 different titles throughout the Nintendo 64's life cycle, which is actually a massive amount of titles when you consider how small and pathetic the platform's library actually is. I genuinely believe that the British company Rare is one of the few reasons the Nintendo 64 even stayed afloat. Out of these 11 games, personally I think 10 of them are actually good. You have Diddy Kong Racing which gives Mario 64 a run for its money, Blast Corps and Jet Force Gemini which are decent games, and Killer Instinct Gold, arguably the only fighter worth playing on the system outside of Super Smash Bros, if you even want to call that a true fighter. 
On top of that, you have four of the best 3D platforming collector maps ever made. These Mario 64 love letters included Donkey Kong 64, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Banjo Kazooie, and Banjo Tooie. Each of these games are titles in which every Nintendo 64 owner needs to have amongst their collection because, let's be honest, there certainly isn't much choice going around on the system. Outside of all of these, you had Bloody Goldeneye, the very game I credit for getting Nintendo 64s into teenagers' bedrooms back in the day. Although extremely dated, retrospectively James Bond's 64 outing is considered one of the most important games in the history of the first person shooter for demonstrating the viability of games consoles as a platform for the genre and for signalling a transition from the then standard like Doom approach to the more realistic style. It pioneered features such as an atmospheric single player missions, stealth elements and a console multiplayer deathmatch mode. The game is frequently cited as one of the greatest video games of all time. Also, as we all know, to shoehorn in the last rare game on this list, the spiritual successor Perfect Dark was released in the year 2000. However, this game never reached the same level of fame and success as Goldeneye. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is how the British saved Nintendo. The 64 already did diabolical in comparison to the PlayStation, so imagine how bad the platform would have performed if it was not British backed. Finally, to give one last thought, next time a fanboy asks you what the Spectrum has done for gaming, educate them that it saved Nintendo's ass and laid the foundations for the future of first person shooters. You have to love the bloody butterfly effect, eh? Thank you for watching today's video, and as usual, I hope you learned something new. Which subject would you like to hear me talk about here? Let me know down below as I will take all the ideas into consideration. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and to check out some of the hundreds of other videos on this channel. I have been producing in-depth content like this every week for nearly two years. Shout out to Shuka Kabayashi, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Agnes Garcia, Edward O'Reilly, Pizza Dawn, Retail Archaeology and all of my other patrons. Thank you for all of your support. Yeah!